Thank you, Donald. Good, and good evening, everybody. And we'll be talk- talking a little bit about, about Donald later on after his dramatic press conference that took place in Trump Tower yesterday. But it's another day and it's another government position paper on our negotiations with the European Union. Now, from the very start, the EU have insisted that there should be no border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. I've often thought to myself over these months, what the hell's it got to do with them? But they've been very insistent. And in due term, the government has said there will be no physical infrastructure on the 310-mile border crossing between the North and the South. It feels to me like every day the EU says, jump. We say, how high? We do it. And then they say, oh, no, that's not good enough. You knock the bar off uh, with your foot as you went over. And, you know, because yesterday, Guy Verhofstadt, my old friend, I say that in inverted commas, from the European Parliament, said invisible borders are a fantasy. But bear one thing in mind. Since the split, since the creation of the independent state of Ireland, we have had, since 1923, a common travel area. Free movement between people from Ireland and the United Kingdom. It has not been an issue for nearly 100 years. Yes, yeah, sure, during the Troubles, uh, border controls were pretty strict and pretty st- you know, tough to stop munitions, bombs, bad people from moving. But, you know, anybody in Dublin that wanted to come and live in London could do so, and vice versa. But there is one problem I think, with what the government's paper says today. And it means that not just citizens of the Republic of Ireland can freely move to the UK, but EU citizens who are in Ireland can also freely move into the UK. So is this indeed a backdoor way that freedom of movement with the European Union actually continues? The other issue, of course, are goods moving between north and south. At the moment, we're all part of a single market. There are no tariffs between the two, so there's no need need to check what goods are moving. If we were to move to a situation where there were tariffs, taxes on goods between Britain and the European Union, well, then, then there would perhaps be an issue. Um, And I, of course, I've argued from the start that one of the ways to have a relatively frictionless border is for the European Union to come to their senses. And indeed, the Irish government recognising how much they sell us far more than we sell them to try and fight for a simple free trade deal between the two of us. What the government have said on this is that actually, you know, with modern technology, they can track lorries that are moving back and forth. They'd be the odd stop and search. And if people weren't declaring truly in a tariff regime what they owed, they would be punitive fines. So that's where we are. You know, the border is going to remain open post-Brexit between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, not just for Irish citizens, but also for European Union citizens too. And I'm asking you, do you think that is the right solution? If you think there should be no border, if you agree with this, then call me on 0345 973. If perhaps you think the only way is to have border checks, to make sure we know who is coming in and out of our country, including EU nationals, then text me on 84850. If you take the view, what the hell's it got to do with those jumped-up commissioners? Can't we just sort this out ourselves? Then using the hashtag Farage and LBC, tweet at LBC now. And, of course, as ever, you can watch me on Facebook. I'm live here from London. I also wonder, and perhaps it's a slightly controversial question, But do you actually care about Northern Ireland? Now, I say this as somebody who is a unionist, as somebody who strongly believes that Northern Ireland is an integral part of the United Kingdom and should be defended. And indeed, I've been to Belfast and many other parts of Northern Ireland and said this publicly on political platforms. But I, I do wonder whether after decades of troubles, whether a lot of you out there have begun to rather give up on Northern Ireland and have begun to think, actually, it isn't really a part of us. I wonder. Uh, Billy in Vauxhall, what solution do you think should be adopted between us and the Republic of Ireland? Hello, Nigel. Um, 
Like, like an awful lot of people in this country, I've got Irish ancestors. Yep. And, but I'm an Englishman, proud to be English. I'm proud of my ancestry on both sides, wherever it comes from. Um, we've got a marvellous fellow in charge of Ireland now. He's a gay fella. The Irish have come forward in the 20th century. They're, they're thinking for themselves. Uh, as, a, as a cradle Catholic, I'm exactly the same. There's an awful lot of rubbish we have to be brought up with. Uh, I think it's marvellous. What the Irish should do, they should be brave enough and say, elect to join the British Commonwealth. They left in 1949. It they did. Enough, it, was, it, was, it was a very sort of little tiff, wasn't it, over which they left? Oh, yeah, it was a plastic, it was a plastic paddy. Uh, Eamon de Valera, um, who was one of these evil people who, who stirred things up. He was one of the fellows at the uh, post office in 1916. Uh, when it came to push and shove, he was the only one who insisted <laughs> that I'm an American. He decided that he was American. You can't shoot me. But he insisted that all these other brave heroes went out and they were shot. And in 1949, he elected, for his own personal view, this is the same man who in 1945 decided yes. to actually walk round to the British embassy, uh, German embassy, and sign the Book of Condolence to Adolf Hitler. I think, wasn't he the, the only, wasn't he the only national global leader that did that? Yes, and it's a disgrace for Ireland. Um, Great Irishmen, they they they, they put their they put their their, um, their their things against the British quite rightly aside in 1939, and they said, you know what, the enemy is fascism, and lots of these fellas, vote and women, they came over and they decided to, to, to destroy Nazism along with everybody else. But De Valera, is the, well, we've all got we've all got shits in in our. In our uh, well, thank you, Billy. Um, yeah, mind sorry, the language, sorry. matey. But. Uh, sorry, um, sorry, old boy. But um, I think if the Irish, if the Irish are welcome, because they're, they're, they're our cousins, they're our friends. Yep. We love the Irish dearly. Uh, like all families, we, we, we slag each other off. But when it comes to the troubles, we stand to re- stand alongside each other. But if the Irish elect to to, um, to vote, uh, come back, join the Commonwealth, yep. um, because there's no problem. They're a republic, but also India's a republic. So we've got no problem with that. And we're... we're, we're Will benefit, they'll benefit. And well, I, Billy, I have talking. to say, I have to say, I agree with that totally. I think that Ireland coming back into the Commonwealth would be a very good thing indeed. Um, and I understand uh, from those that know about these things uh, that one or two conversations along those lines have been going on over the course of the last year. Uh, and why? Well, of course, because uh, whatever the reasons they left for back in '49, actually, Anglo-Irish relations are phenomenal. I mean, who would have thought, you know, certainly someone of my age, that we would see the Queen go to visit the Republic and to be greeted and treated the way in which she was? I genuinely think there's a fabulous relationship now between our countries and the Commonwealth would be, without doubt, a start. But maybe, Billy, maybe the really real solution is one that Irish politicians and bureaucrats and media types and experts couldn't possibly contemplate maybe the best thing for Ireland, given that she's stuck in the wrong currency, given that nearly all of her overseas business is denominated in dollars or sterling, maybe the Irish should leave the European Union and we could then work out our own terms between us. I think it'd be ideal. It'd be ideal. And also, you don't have to have been a part of the British Empire to join the Commonwealth because Mozambique I know. elected to, to join. And um, I think it'd be ideal. Ireland for the Irish, and it'd be marvellous, because it's, it's ridiculous. It's just an artificial border across. They all like each other, really. Forget about the politics. That's all history. You know, you even know about the, um, the war, the orange, the orange war with the uh, James yep. I. That's not even... That, that's, that's never taught in our uh, classes, quite rightly, because it was a foreign skirmish. It was a European... EU, uh, a pre-EU... EU, well, the, a Dutch, the, um, Dutch king... Um, B- and Billy, I can assure you there are parts of East Belfast where good King Billy is still somebody who is heavily celebrated. But, Billy, very interesting point, and a very positive point. Billy arguing that through the Commonwealth we become mates and friends and perhaps ultimately the Commonwealth could become something of value in terms of trade. Simple answer is to have passport controls at ports from Ireland. Surely if we have border controls when we leave, this would happen anyway. Ian from Beaconsfield. Well, Ian, that's right. I mean, obviously for anybody to get to the mainland, they either have to catch a ferry or they have to catch a flight. So they have to show a passport and check in so we would know what EU nationals were coming into. The mainland of the UK from Northern Ireland. That's true. Um, It's sort of 
part of the reason why I'm not foaming at the mouth and fulminating over what has been said today. But it's still, whichever way you cook it, it still is a backdoor for EU nationals through open borders to get into the United Kingdom if you believe that Northern Ireland should remain an integral part of the UK. And I do. I make no bones about that. I'm not sure everyone else does. I care about Northern Ireland. Even if I didn't care about Northern Ireland, I value they are a necessary part of our government. I get what they are now, of course, because arguably, since Theresa May's election, with the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, propping up the government, arguably, Northern Ireland has more influence in the United Kingdom than it's perhaps ever, ever had. Mr Farage, don't be concerned by borders. The UK is not leaving the EU, says Jimmy. Jimmy, stop it. I can't hear that. It upsets me too much. Jack in Bromsgrove, what's the solution to the Irish border? Good evening, Nigel. Good evening. In your introduction, you yep. said something that upset me a little bit and it got me a bit concerned. OK. Now, I know you do like to have a go at the European Union and normally I'd agree with you, but you said what on earth does it have to do with them about the border? I did. Well... Ireland is part of the EU and is therefore part of this negotiating team. Isn't that right? Uh, well, actually, being a small state, they've got virtually no say at all, is the reality. Um, they and, are and part of the... They're part of the EU, but they're a little state, and little states have no say at all in Brussels. And, and the negotiating team, you know, basically is a Frenchman um, helped by a Belgium. But the Frenchman has to speak on behalf of all the states. Yes, he does, but I don't think... I mean, yes, OK, they're a union of 27, Jack, I get that point. But I do feel that their insistence... Think... Well, hang on. The European I'm Union sorry. don't insist that Romania has an open border with, with Moldova um, or that Greece has an open border with Turkey. So why are they insisting that the United Kingdom has an open border? With, I, mean, I mean, All I'm saying is they've gone too far with all of this. OK, Nigel, I understand that. And you go on... I, I understand, but Ireland is a country that borders the first ever country to leave the EU. Yes. And no other country does. So you can't say that just because they're a small part of the EU that they're not... They are important in this. They are the only country bordering the first ever country to leave the European Union. Jack. And that gives them an incredibly important position in this. Jack, I take your point and I'm going to tell you the absolute reason why the European Union actually have to be involved in this decision. I'll do it in just a minute. So why are the European Union, Monsieur Barnier, in his haughty French arrogant tone, poking their noses into our business and telling us that we have to, once we've left the European Union, have an open border with the Republic of Ireland, <coughs> which at that point will still be a member of the European Union? I'll tell you why. Because we've committed to doing it. It was something called the Good Friday Agreement, signed by, and I know... He is the most popular political figure for all the listeners and interactors with this show, Tony Blair. Yes, that's right, Tony Blair. Because in that Good Friday Agreement, it says that we have to consider the European dimension of relevant matters, including the implementation of EU policies and programmes and proposals under consideration in the EU framework, and that views have to be taken into account and represented appropriately at relevant EU meetings. That's the answer, folks. Tony Blair, who, of course, always, always loved the European Union and wanted them to take some credit, along with himself, for the ceasing of hostilities that happened just about 20 years ago. I'm very pleased that those hostilities ended, although we did, <laughs> as we've now found out, sign ourselves up to a situation that no-one at that time could have foreseen. We also did... Uh, released back into Northern Ireland, 420 convicted murderers from both sides of the divide. And there are many who feel that perhaps that was too high a price to pay. I certainly felt so at the time, though it has to be said, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Belfast is a lot better than it was 20 years ago. Rob says on Facebook, why don't they have an open border and have security checks at airports and ports to the mainland UK? Rob, that's exactly what they're going to do. 
So as far as the mainland UK is concerned, we will have checks. We will know exactly who is coming in, who is going out. Uh, but, that, but, but, but the fact is that for people in Northern Ireland, there is going to be an open border. Richard says, do not mess with the border of Ireland and Northern Ireland, but ensure there is a hard border because uh, between Ireland, Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Well, that hard border, Richard, will be there. Two of you thinking along those lines. Richard says to me, and another Richard says to me, and this is great, actually. If the Irish hadn't had a second referendum forced upon them, we wouldn't have this problem. And here it is. One of the great myths is that the Irish love the European Union. It's a pro-EU country. Indeed, I did a debate with Michael O'Leary from Ryanair in Brussels towards the end of last year, in which O'Leary mocked the British for being anti the European Union because his country was so pro. Twice in the last 16 years, the Irish people have voted against European treaties in referendums, including the Lisbon Treaty just a few years ago, and... Both times they were told they had to vote again. And I took part uh, very heavily in that Lisbon Treaty referendum, Lisbon 1 and Lisbon 2. Um, indeed, in the first referendum, um, I managed through the European Information Budget to send a leaflet to every house in Ireland, um, asking them whether they were quite sure about this treaty. And I was very pleased at the time uh, that the Irish Taoiseach their Prime Minister, uh, blamed the no vote on me. He said I'd hijacked Irish democracy. I felt very proud. There was a second referendum, and I've never seen such a one-sided contest in terms of media, money and everything else. But the idea, the idea that the people of Ireland love the EU, whereas the people of the UK hate the EU, is a complete myth. They think about it. Do you know what? In pretty much the same way. Um, and please, any of you, uh, that are out there listening in any part of Ireland that have a strong view on this, please get in touch on 0345 6060 And I'm going to John in Aberdeenshire. John, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. I just wanted to uh, re-emphasise, I think your previous caller mentioned it, the only way of solving this problem is to have passport control and checks from people travelling between the island of Ireland, including the north, and the mainland UK, and that would solve the problem. However... I understand that the unionists, the Ulster unionists, who are in alliance with propping up uh, Theresa May... Not, but, but John, John, just a little correction. The Ulster unionists were the big party in Northern Ireland under David Trimble mm. at the time leading up to, you, you know, the, the, the Good Friday Agreement, mm. but they've now virtually disappeared, and it's, it's the Reverend Ian Paisley's old party, the Democratic unionists, who are yeah, now in the, the driving UP, seat. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So the only problem is that I believe the DUP are opposed to that solution, being uh, UK citizens. They, uh, they're opposed to having to show their passports when they're travelling from the north of Ireland into the UK. But that's the only way of solving the problem. Otherwise, it's just a backdoor route for um, freedom of movement from the EU coming through Northern Ireland. Well, if any party, John, in Northern Ireland was going to be pro a strong border, you would have thought it would have been the DUP, who are generally seen to be much tougher and harder line on issues, but they themselves are pretty relaxed about this. Uh, they, I guess they're all a bit fearful. I mean, the circum Northern Ireland is a part of the UK, but boy, the circumstances are different. And I think there are a lot of people in Northern Ireland who are prepared to compromise on this because they don't want the Good Friday Agreement to break down. So even even MPs like Ian Paisley, the current or junior, perhaps, as, as you might call him, the son, even Ian Paisley, junior, somebody that I campaign with in the referendum for us to leave, even he thinks, actually, we need to have a relaxed solution about this border. So you're saying the DUP have more or less agreed to have passport and checks? No, they've agreed to have a pretty open border, John. That's the point I'm making. Well, I'm... how are you going to stop freedom of movement coming the EU people and other people outside coming through the Northern Ireland and into the UK? Well, I think, John, the honest truth is uh, that if we start off post-Brexit with a completely open border, but we find there are abuses, abuses because tariffs of some kind have been put in place and people are playing games on customs duties, or if there are suspicions uh, that actually, you know, people are being, uh, perhaps even against their will, moved one way or the other across the border, then we might have to change our minds. Yeah, OK. The obvious solution, obviously, is for the Irish Republic to come out of the EU. Absolutely, John. <laughs> I agree with that. I agree with that totally. And whenever I go to Dublin, 
and say that, and I get screamed at on chat shows or Irish talk radio, and they say it's impossible, you know, this country believes in European Union. As I just said, John, twice in the last 16 years, they voted against it. Don't think it can't happen. Um, I get by from Ben, on text, easy. We will just end up checking them when they come from Northern Ireland to the mainland. I know that means freedom of movement in the whole of Ireland, but I can't see any other option as it currently stands. Uh, ben, I think you might be right. Here's me going soft, but I think you might be right. Um, I, I, I just, I don't think anybody wants to undo the Good Friday Agreement. It's not perfect, but boy, things in Northern Ireland are a damn sight better than they were 20 years ago. Um, Brendan in Harrow, good evening. You're an Irishman, I believe. I am indeed, Nigel. So what do you think, Brendan? I mean, we, we've, we, 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 we've had this open border for nearly 100 years. It's not been a problem, and it shouldn't be a problem. It's just this dimension of EU citizens, isn't it? Other EU citizens. Yeah, I mean, the border, I don't think, can go back in place. It would cause more problems than it would solve. Um, I think a physical border would cause tension. Yep. Um, I, th I think, as like some of your previous callers said, I think uh, the UK needs to get its own house in order before it looks at the island of Ireland. I mean, I travel home quite a bit. If I fly into Dublin, my passport gets checked. I fly back to the UK, I walk off the airport, off the airplane, and straight out the airport. Right, yeah, that's a very interesting point. Um, but, 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 Brendan, uh, despite what you just said, Northern Ireland is still part of the UK, isn't it? It is still part of the UK, yes. But there's... The, as the island of Ireland, Ireland, there shouldn't be a border between the north and south because I think it would cause trouble. Mm, 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 I mm. think that the, the imposition of a physical border would give people something to target or to get upset about. And could it, Brendan, in your view as an Irishman, could the reimposition of a hard border perhaps pose some threat to the Good Friday Agreement? Yes. Yeah, I 100% believe that, yeah. OK, Brendan, right. you've made your point very, very clearly, and I think it's one that many, I think it's one that many in the north of Ireland are concerned about. You know, the Good Friday Agreement represented, you know, a massive compromise for many, many people over there. You know, after 30 years of bloody war in which thousands of people died. Uh, and I think what we're seeing, as I say, from people like my friend Ian Paisley Jr. is a, a mood to compromise, perhaps, on this issue. More government positions for the day on how we're going to approach the renegotiation with the European Union, including an open border that will continue to exist in Ireland between the North and the Republic. And that'll mean, just as it has for the last hundred years, there'll be a common travel area between us and the Irish. It also means other EU citizens will be able to move across that border too. But I cannot let tonight go by without talking about Donald Trump yesterday who returned to New York. Now, he hasn't been there much lately, but he was back at Trump Tower and he gave a press conference. It was a pretty extraordinary event. Um, he insisted last night that both sides, by which he means far right, far left, uh, were to blame for the trouble at a rally in Charlottesville last weekend. Just listen to this press conference. There was a group on this side that came violently attacking the other group. So you can say what you want, but that's the way it is. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it, and you don't have any doubt about it either. Well, that was Donald Trump, um, as ever, doing his best to charm the liberal media in New York. Um, it's very interesting. He had said the day before, he'd utterly condemned anybody who held far-right, neo-Nazi, Ku Klux Klan views. Uh, but what he was saying uh, last night wasn't just that actually the far left can behave pretty badly too, and that violence from them is as bad as violence from the far right, which surely must be right, mustn't it? But he also echoed something that I'd said the previous evening on this show, which was that wanting to get rid of a statue of General E. Lee, the Virginian, one of the Confederate commanders, uh, given that, ironically, he was actually one of the more liberal commanders on the southern side who wanted ultimately to see an end to slavery uh, was a horrible attempt to rewrite history by very dangerous hard left people and he also made the point that I made who next is it George Washington 
the greatest American hero of all, but he was a slave owner. They worked on his plantations, on his estate at Mount Vernon, is the next target for the hard left in America to get rid of statues of Washington, to perhaps even rename one of their states on the West Coast and their capital city. But it has led to those that perhaps don't like him or those who are scared of criticism, coming out and absolutely condemning him, including the British Prime Minister. She said, I see no equivalence between those who propound fascist views and those who oppose them. I think it's important for all those in positions of responsibility to condemn far-right views wherever we hear them. Uh, Prime Minister, he did the day before condemn far-right views, but he said... Those on the hard left can be violent too. And can, I, can I just say this? The idea that an organisation that calls itself anti-fascist, against fascism, uh, that, pro that professes itself to be for love and hope and optimism, in my personal experience over the course of the last few years, many people in those groups I have personally seen are some of the most unpleasant and violent people I've ever seen. There is a very hard left intolerant fascism that occurs on the left as well as those on issues of race or religion on the far right. And, and you may, and I, do, I can't stand the concept. I said I was shocked to see people in 21st century America using Nazi salutes. I'm not supporting these people, but actually, crime is a crime. Violence is violence by whoever it's committed. But Trump is coming in for total condemnation by the liberal media in the United States of America and by virtually everybody in this country for saying something that I think is right. There we are. Now, the other very interesting story today. <coughs> you remember last week... Uh, we talked about Sarah Champion. She's the Labour Member of Parliament for Rotherham. Uh, she's the one who thought it was funny when violent protesters uh, had me holed up in an office in Rotherham uh, because I dared to question what was going on with the grooming gangs in that particular town. And she came out last week and wrote a column in the Sun newspaper saying Britain has a problem with British Pakistani men raping and exploiting white girls. And I said on the show last week, it was very brave of her to say that, uh, but, but that somebody actually probably did need to say it. So the news today, Sarah Champion quits Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet after warning Pakistani men are raping white girls. Uh, Champion cited the column in The Sun. Uh, she said that, uh, you know, she'd been misquoted in the article, but The Sun responded by saying uh, that actually, you know, uh, her own office had said it was great. Um, Corbyn said it's right that she's gone. Strikes me that in the modern-day Labour Party, uh, you cannot exist or survive in office of any kind if you choose to speak out on issues like this. Now, breaking news. Our political editor, Theo Usherwood, has been speaking directly to Jeremy Corbyn on this issue. And I believe, uh, Theo, that you've managed to get a question in about Sarah Champion's future. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Yes, I did manage to get a question in about Sarah Champion's future because Jeremy Corbyn is here in Carlisle uh, addressing a rally of 500 or so supporters. It's part of his tour of the country to uh, drum up support should uh, a general election follow uh, in the near future. And he wants to keep the momentum going uh, from uh, June's result. Of course, Labour didn't win, but they did much better than many expected. But there has been a, a, a bit of a row this afternoon, a storm this afternoon, about whether Sarah Champion, the MP for Rotherham, was right to resign as a result of that article in The Sun. And it was a question that I put to Mr Corbyn directly. I think she was right to step down, and in her words, she said uh, her continued presence there would be a distraction. We've had a very pleasant exchange on the subject. I, you've always got on very well with Sarah Champion. Uh, we cannot demonise whole communities or whole groups of people because of the actions of some people. Abuse of women is wrong, exploitation of women is wrong, and from wherever it comes. But I don't think it's correct to demonise an entire community, and that's why um, I've said what I said about the way in which The Sun have reported this and dealt with it. And uh, Sarah will continue to work with all of us on issues of um, women's rights, equality and safety. And there's a way back for her? Yes, of course. The key bit there, 
there's a way back for Sarah Champion uh, in the in the future. I don't think it'll be any time uh, soon. Jeremy Corbyn trying, if you like, to uh, at the same time distance himself from the comments, saying that she was right to step down, uh, but then you know acknowledging uh, that she was uh, she she played a part in his shadow cabinet and not really. Uh, you know, criticising her in the strongest possible terms, uh, and I think that'll be welcomed by members of the Parliamentary Labour Party. But clearly, Theo, she was pushed, wasn't she? Yes, it does look as if there had been uh, a, com a conversation that had led to her uh, resignation. Whether that came directly from the leader's office, I'm not sure about that. Uh, there's also a, the, the part of the problem for Sarah Champion was that Trevor Cav Kavanagh, the very well-respected uh, columnist uh, the Sun, and so, uh, very senior uh, editor, associate editor at the Sun, and uh, close friends with the hierarchy there, very much embedded with the hierarchy there, wrote a, uh, an article, uh, an opinion piece, in which he finished by saying that there was a, a Muslim problem and that has attracted a, a large number of complaints so mm. that if you like added to yeah. uh, the heat that Sarah Champion is is uh, is facing right now. Yeah. yeah no Theo thank you very much indeed well Jeremy Corbyn making it clear uh, that there is absolutely no problem at all uh, yes. no problem at all uh, with any particular community or religion in this country these things just happen they just happen, folks. Th you know, hundreds, thousands of young white girls just happen to get raped. There is no problem. Let's sweep it under the carpet and pretend it simply isn't happening. There you are. Well, back to this border between the north and the south in Ireland. And we're going to Lisburn in Northern Ireland. Brian, good evening. Good evening, how are you? Is this the right solution, Brian? <laughs> of course it is. We, for over 40 years, lost thousands of people and had tens of thousands injured over yeah. this border. Yeah. And really, at the end of the day, people of Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland aren't going to put up with British interference in, in, in our country anymore. We are no longer going to be the front line of British policy. We're not a tool to be played with. We have to be considered our rights as well. OK. But, Brian, the United Kingdom, of which you're a part, did vote to leave the European Union. Um, and one of the demands, if you like, from the public was that we should have proper, proper border controls. But what you're arguing is that Northern Ireland should be an exception to that rule. OK, not only that, Nigel, but let's put it in real terms. The people of Northern Ireland didn't vote to leave the EU. The people of Scotland didn't vote to leave the EU. The majority of people now in Wales are regretting voting to leave the EU. Oh, they weren't last night, Brian, on this show. I had three of them from South Wales ringing up. They were so Eurosceptic, they made me look moderate. OK, so three out of maybe, what, five and a half million people? That's not really good, oh, a good ratio. Uh, but bro, 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 say, back to Northern Ireland, come on. Yeah, the people in Northern Ireland, the majority of us are British in relation to, to finances and or the economy. The uh -huh. economy. Uh -huh. I personally am British to, for the economy, but I'm Irish as far as culture is concerned. Mm -hmm. And you are interfering in our lives once again. And the only thing that's going to be achieved by the vile Tories and you idiot keepers, kippers, is simply to split the United Kingdom up. And is that what you just want? You just want hang on, Brian. Just hang on, Brian. The government today... You just want the United Kingdom of England? Hang on, Brian. Hang on, Brian. The government have today have said they're not going to interfere in Northern Ireland. They're going to leave the border as it is. Surely you welcome that? Of course I do. Right. But the, gov the government in, in, in Westminster at the minute haven't got a clue what they're doing. Well, that may well they're, be true. They're, they're, they, they, they have not got a, a, a clue. See this idea of, oh, you can't set all your cards on the table. We have to keep uh, things up our sleeves to, uh, to, uh, to leave our negotiations. That's rubbish. The EU know exactly what the British government want, and the British government know exactly what the EU want. So there's no point in pussyfooting about. What we should simply do is make the best of a, a bad lot here. I've actually said them right. This is what we're proposing. No border in, 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 mm -hmm. in between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. The people of Northern Ireland, when we travel to England, are already treated like foreigners. It's not border, border uh, police at, the, at, the, uh, at all the entry gates. It's special branch. So what's the difference of us showing a passport when we go in? OK, Brian, fine. You should be satisfied with today's ruling. Um, and I suspect, actually, a lot in both communities in Northern Ireland, I suspect a big majority in Northern Ireland today think this was the only possible solution, with the proviso that if abuses take place government will step in. Well, there's going to be an open border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. That is what the government is proposing. It's what the EU demanded. And actually, those of us like me who think, why don't the EU just go and sling their hook? 
Of course, can't really say that because Tony Blair wrote it in to the Good Friday Agreement that they had to be involved and consulted on all of these issues. Oliver says on Facebook, we've had 400 plus years of complicated history with Ireland resulting in a peace process. This should be separate from Brexit. Oliver, it can't be separate from Brexit. It can't be given this agreement that we're signed up to. Thank you, Mr Blair. Um, John says, tourists would be free to cross borders based on their passport straight visas. Goods do not need to be checked at borders. They can be checked based on intelligence. Well, John, actually, with satellite tracking and photography and everything else, to an extent you're right, but there would need to be the odd spot check to make sure wholesale abuse isn't happening. Um, and a position here that I rather agree with, um, Amanda from Hartley in Kent, uh, and she texts in and she says, Hi, Nigel, I have friends in Ulster. And although they want Brexit, they don't want a physical border with error. As, as we've already said, the solution's obvious. We control people coming from Ulster at all other points into the UK. And Amanda, I think you're right. I have to say that the vast majority of Brexiteers that I met in Northern Ireland didn't want a hard border because they're scared that that might begin to unravel the peace process, which, whilst imperfect is a lot better than the way things were before. Patrick in Battersea, good evening. Is this the right solution? I don't know. I'm wondering why you didn't tell us this was, was going to happen before, Nigel. Funny enough, Patrick, I did. And when I was in Belfast during the referendum campaign, and we discussed all of this, and I was asked by BBC Ulster on a lunchtime interview, did it mean there would have to be a hard border between Northern Ireland and ERA? I said no, but we would have to keep an open mind on this to make sure that it wasn't being abused as a backdoor way of smuggling people into the United Kingdom from the European Union. That's what I said, Patrick. Well, obviously, it's going to be a soft border. Yes. Because we, we, we have to maintain that soft border between a EU country and ourselves, given where we're talking about. We're talking about Northern Ireland. We're and talking we about a very a exceptional... Border, we're going to have real problems. We're talking about a very exceptional place, aren't we, in Northern Ireland, and, and, and what has been a very, very troubled place. And, Patrick, I would say this to you. Even as somebody that is seen to be a hard-line Brexiteer, although compared to many of our texters and tweeters, I'm not sure I am, but even me, Patrick, as a hard-line Brexiteer, accepts that there are some sensible compromises occasionally that need to be made. Well, how come we're not hearing that from, you know, with the, the rest of the negotiations then? You see, the problem I've got with Brexiteers, right, they're asking for things. And when those things are delivered to them, they don't like them. We want our courts to make decisions. Suddenly they're saboteurs. We want our parliament to make decisions. No, we can't have that. They might vote against us. We want our borders back. We don't want that French border back in reality. We, we want stricter controls at the airports. And now we get stricter controls over the past few weeks. Nobody likes it. Well, I think, Patrick, I really what we want. want. I think really what... I tell you what, Patrick, we really want, Brexiteers. We want our democratic mandate respected and carried out sensibly. And I think what's hacking us off uh, is that we're seeing a government that took nine months to trigger Article 50, has now told us there'll be transitional arrangements for goodness knows how many years to come. And I think, Patrick, Brexiteers are getting worried whether they're going to get Brexit in name only. Well, what's, what they should do is think about how long it takes for these processes, and it is a negotiation to come through. You can't just have Brexit the morning after and suddenly we're out. That's nonsense. Well, you as could. Well, you know. well, you no, could. we couldn't. Well, you could. Nigel, you couldn't even get out of a marriage with a woman in that space of time. What are you talking about? Well, you could do it if you wanted to, but it, but, but, but it wouldn't necessarily be the wisest thing to do. And I get that, exactly. and I understand that. So I understand that, and that's why, could. Patrick, that's why, Patrick, albeit with some reluctance, I did say, all right, let's go along with the Article 50 process. Let's accept that it'll take up to two years, but hope it can be dealt with more quickly. I did accept that from the start. Now I'm being told it's going to be years and years and years more. I'm not particularly happy. But, Patrick, I mean, tell me something. You know, you're very unhappy with the arguments of Brexiteers. Would you like a second referendum? No, I wouldn't like a second referendum. What I want to happen is for everything to go through. I know, I got a feeling I know what's going to happen. And when the people who you led into this hole start hunting you lot down to hang you lot by your heels, that's when I'll be happy. Patrick, you're quite right. 
I think it's absolutely morally disgusting that people like me should have argued that the United Kingdom should be an independent, self-governing, democratic nation. How monstrous of me! How dreadful! David, who's also in Battersea. David, good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Pleasure so, to talk to you. Pleasure to talk uh, to you. You covered so, all the points I was going to yeah. say, was that as long as you have control from Ulster coming into England, mm -hmm. they're quite willing to show their passports when they fly to Tenerife, a friend of mine. Yep. Uh, there's a thing called API, which is advanced passenger information you yep. have to supply every time you fly. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem? If you haven't got an Irish passport or an English passport, don't get on the plane. Well, they can get on the plane, but we need to know who they are. That's really the point, David, isn't it? And, I mean, the only concern with this, and I was putting it forward as a debating point at the top of the hour, the only concern with this was, would it be a backdoor way for huge numbers of EU citizens from, be it France or Bulgaria or wherever it may be, to get into the United Kingdom because there wasn't going to be a hard border between Northern and Southern Ireland. Uh, but actually, uh, my conclusion, David, is that there are very few people in Northern Ireland who appear to be worried about that, and given that to get from there to the mainland, they've got to buy a ferry ticket or they've got to buy an aeroplane ticket, uh, I think, David, we're all quite relaxed about this. Yeah, Ireland's always been our sister country. I mean, we don't want to have problems with them. Well, do you know what? Through history, we've had huge problems with them. And my feeling is, over the last 15, 20 years, our relationship with them has become really very, very good. I know their new Prime Minister has said some pretty tough things about Brexit, although I'm not sure they're things that, that a majority of the Irish population would agree with. But, David, I agree with you. We want good relations with Ireland. Absolutely, we do. Um, and my last going to be Peter, who is in Beedale in North Yorkshire. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Nigel, and thank you for taking my call. This has been really, really interesting. Good. The, the difficulty here is that there are two almost insurmountable issues, the first of which is the actual border between the six counties of Northern Ireland mm -hmm. and the Irish Republic is very complex and runs through individual properties so cannot really be made into a physical border. And the uh, creation of a harder border mm -hmm. at the ports of exit to the United Kingdom would, to, uh, in a cultural sense, start to look like a United Ireland to many people on the Protestant side of the history in Northern <laughs> Ireland. And, and they hold some very deep and, to us, not logical positions uh, to the point where they actually have to have the marching commission to organise some events during the summer months. There are real disturbances and arguments about where a particular bonfire is held on particular nights. Hmm. And, and though it would obviously seem sensible to us that there should be a hardening of the, of the border within the free trade area, that will actually cause some difficulties politically in Northern Ireland. I understand Thank your you point, know. Peter. I understand your point, but I would say this to you, that right now you have to actually, you know, show a passport when you're flying. When, you know, when you board at Belfast, whether it's at George Best or at International, as I've done many times in the last few years, you have to show a passport anyway. So I'm not actually overly flummoxed by it. Peter, we've simply run out of time. One time for one just last text. Brussels won't talk about trade deals until the Irish problem is sorted. However, these two issues are interlinked. We need to know what the deal is, with us, is on trade before we can define the border. This is nuts, says Peter in Warwickshire. Well, to some extent, Peter, you're right. Uh, one of the best solutions for the border is, of course, for the Irish government to insist that the EU gives us a tariff-free trade deal. Overall, I'm not overly concerned this will lead to backdoor smuggling of EU citizens into our country.